Okay, looking at section 7a, Fundamentals of Probability from the Bennett and Briggs text. Let's start off with an example. A local snowboard sale features nine, different, nine types of boards, eight types of bindings, and 12 types of boots. How many different board binding boot combinations are available? So we've got nine choices for the boards, and eight choices for the bindings, and then 12 choices for the boots. When a lot of people see that, they think that the answer is going to end up being 9 plus 8 plus 12, but it turns out that when you're in this sort of situation, it ends up being a multiplication. So what we want to do for this is say there's 9 times 8 times 12 different combinations for how that can turn out. And so when we go to do that count, let's do that on the calculator, we have 9 times 8 times 12 we get 864 different combinations. And that might sound pretty surprising at first. Maybe you're even thinking he must be wrong. It must really be 9 plus 8 plus 12. But there really are that many different options. Uh, and one way that you could kind of illustrate that is let's say that I was going to make a three digit long number. Then in each of these choices, I have uh, in each of these blanks, I have 10 choices. So, you know, for example, I could write 600 and 23 or something. But when I fill that in and I go to do that first blank, I could put a 0, a 1, a 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. So if you think about how many choices I have there, I have 10. And then I go to the next one, I have 10 choices for what to put there. Again, a 0 through a 9. And when I get to the last one, I have 10 choices, a 0 through a 9. And I'm claiming that that means I have 10 times 10 times 10 or a thousand different choices for how I could fill that in. And that makes sense because the smallest choice that I might make there would be three zeros, which would be the number zero, and the biggest choice I could make would be 999. And if you thought of how many numbers there are from 1 to 999, that would obviously be 999, and then you throw in the zero and that takes you up to 1,000. But if you did a plus saying I have 10 choices, 10 choices, 10 choices, you would only get 30 different possibilities, and we can see the 1,000 is right. So that idea that when you have nine choices here, eight choices there, and 12 in the final spot, and you go to put those together by choosing one from each, that to figure out how many different ways those can be combined, you multiply, that comes um, from something called the fundamental rule of counting. And it states that if there's x simple outcomes for experiment one, and y simple outcomes for experiment two, then there's not x plus y simple outcomes, but there's x times y simple outcomes when the experiments are combined. And when you uh, look at the words that came up there, like outcomes and event, I'll just explain quickly what those are. An outcome is the most basic possible result or observation from an experiment, and an event consists of one or more of the outcomes that share a property of interest. So I thought I'd just make that visual for you here. If I roll, roll a die, looks like I got a one with the fabulous Las Vegas side showing, and that one side is a simple outcome. This four is another simple outcome. That two is another simple outcome. So when I think about um, the outcomes, it's just like what are all the different sides that could end up showing, and each one of those is a simple outcome. An event consists of one or more of those that share a common property. So for example, I might say the event that the die turns out to be even. Well, that could be a two or a four or a six. Any of those would be even numbers. So any of those three sides is going to make that happen. I would say the event that the die is an even number is not a simple outcome because there's more than one uh, outcome that makes it happen. So when we refer to simple outcomes, those are things that can only occur in one way, like the two. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and practice this fundamental rule of counting a little bit more. You're required to take five courses, one from humanities, one from social uh, sociology, one from science, one from math, and one from music. But you have some choices as you go through. When you look at your humanities, you have four choices, it says. When you go to sociology, there's three to choose from. In science, you have five choices. In math, there's only two. And in music, you've got three. So when you think about how many different ways can my schedule be put together with different courses, and you're thinking, what are all the combinations that are possible if I do one of each? We've got 4, 3, 5, 2, and 3. So what do I do? I add them up, not according to the fundamental rule of counting. It says 
If there's four different ways you can take humanities and three for sociology, that's seven combos. That's 12 combos that you should be multiplying. So our answer here should be four from the humanities times three for sociology times five from science times two for math and times three for music. And if we multiply that all out, let's see, that's a 10 and a 9. That'd be 90 times 4. Looks like 360 different schedules that we could put together when we make the choices of those five courses um, from those different areas and choosing from the options that are available. So again, when we have um, different choices to make and we have different possibilities in each one and we're trying to count how many different ways can that all fit together, the fundamental rule of counting says multiply those options together rather than adding them. All right, uh, so that's all still about counting, and we're going to start moving on to probability here in a moment. So just a quick note about how to express probability. The probability of an event is usually expressed as P of some event description, and it's always going to end up be, being between 0 and 1 inclusive, meaning a probability can be as low as 0, as high as 1, or anything in between. A probability of 0 means the event is impossible, and a probability of 1 means the event is certain. We're going to move on to some examples on the next page, but since I have the die handy, let me just show you some event notation. Um, for what I was just showing you a moment ago. We could say what's the probability that when you roll a die you get an even number and we just saw that if you look at that die we've got three different sides that the two, the six, and the four are even out of six possibilities so the probability would be three out of six which is a half or 0.5. So we see a couple things there. We see the notation, the probability that we get an even number so we're using the P to read probability of. We put the event we want inside the parentheses, and then notice the answer comes out as a number that's between 0 and 1. Uh, and that answer could be 1 half. It could also be 0.5. So we can have a fraction form or a decimal form, and you'll see that we even use a percentage form at times as well. All right, moving on to page 6, let's go ahead and continue with our examples of probability. We had a quick look at an example using a die, and now we're going to move to a deck of cards. And our experiment is going to be to select a card at random. And they want us to consider the events that are listed below. And then they want to find the probabilities of some various things. So one of the things that we'll often do in probability, if we have word descriptions for events, like the event that the card is a jack of spades, we might feel like if we're going to refer to that a bunch of times, we might not want to write it over and over. So one thing we can do is we can take a capital letter and say this A is going to represent that. When I tell you these letters A, B, C, D, that's always temporary for the problem we're on, not something you have to remember for later. And speaking of which, all the stuff that I'm going to use here for cards is just for examples. Uh, it might come up in homework as well, but I don't put card questions on tests, so don't feel like you have to memorize things about a deck of cards to get ready for the exam. We just want to get uh, some ideas of how probability work from looking at this example. So let's look at the event that the card is a jack of spades and say what's the probability of that event. So when you go to do probability, we'll define this at the bottom of the page, but we usually would say that what you're going to do is f over n, where f is the number of jack of spades there are, and n is the number of cards there are, or in general, n is how many different things are possible in your experiment, and f is how many meet the description listed right here. So up here it says the deck has 52 cards, so if our experiment is to pick one at random, then we had 52 choices. And then when it comes to the question, how many jack of spades are there, I'll bring the jack of spades in here and mention that. Um, when you say that it's a jack, we refer to that as the denomination. When we say it's a spade, um, that's referring to the suit. So you have different suits like spades or, or maybe diamonds here on one of the other cards. So it turns out that if you specify a denomination like a jack and a suit, when you get both of those things, that always it narrows it down to just a single card in the deck. So the probability of a jack of spades should be 1 out of 52. And I think there's nothing wrong with giving the answer that way, but sometimes people like to think of probability in terms of percentages. And what would make it easier to do that would be if we converted it to a decimal. So 1 out of 52. When I go to a decimal, I'm going to bring in some error by rounding that, so I put approximately equal. I usually put four decimal places on my probability unless I'm asked to do something different. So I would say 0 0.0192. So either of these answers is good, 
What's nice about this one is people could move the decimal over two spots and say there's a 1.92% chance that if you randomly pick a card it would end up being the jack of spades and people often like to think of probability in terms of percentages. Alright, let's try that again for the probability of B. Let's see what the event B is. B is that the card is a jack. So we're still choosing from 52 cards and now we want to think how many of those cards meet the description of being a jack and I don't have all the jacks handy here but when you mention a specific denomination and not a suit there's always going to be four options if I take the jack of spades that's one option but there's also a jack of diamonds in the deck, a jack of hearts, and a jack of clubs so if you mention just a denomination but you don't say what suit it is there's always going to be four of those whether that's a jack we're referring to, a seven, an eight, anything like that you could reduce this and you might need to if my math lab says give a reduced version and then do that. Typically what I would do is just go straight to a decimal. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you that here. So I would do the 4 out of 52 and say 0 0.0769. And so that would be the probability of getting a jack. And then moving on to C, what's the probability that the card is a spade? So still choosing out of 52 cards so that's our denominator and now this time we're just mentioning the suit the spade and there's four different suits I just mentioned that there's uh, I can probably show you all of them here real quick there's clubs there's diamonds there's hearts and then we have the spade so those are the different ones and there's only four there's an equal amount of every one and it says up here there's 52 cards in the deck so if we split that into four suits that should be 13 for each suit and it turns out that is the case so if somebody asks you what's the probability of a specific suit it would be 13 out of 52 and I didn't reduce the last one but it's kinda nice to see this one reduced that reduces to one out of four because there's only four suits in the deck so the chance you get any specific one should reduce to one-fourth and don't need my calculator for that one that's exactly 0 0.25 or a 25 percent chance and then finally, what's the probability of D? So what is D? It actually doesn't matter what D is when I think about the denominator. My experiment is to randomly pick a card, so the denominator is still going to be 52. But then when we go to do the numerator, we really do have to think about that event, and that's the event that it's a face card. So the face cards are the jacks, the queens, and the kings and a pretty simple reason why they're called face cards there's his face there's her face there's his face uh, it's a common misconception by some people that aces are face cards but there's an ace and I don't see a face on it anywhere and so if you go look this up and try and find out what is the common uh, belief on that it would be that these three are face cards the ace is not so there's somebody out there giving people bad information but there's our face cards so have with me having just shown you this, you might be tempted to say, okay, I guess there's three face cards, but remember, there's four of each denomination. There's four jacks, there's four queens, and there's four kings altogether. So there's actually 12 face cards. So we have our four jacks, our four queens, and our four kings, and that adds up to 12 cards altogether out of 52. And again, that can be reduced. I personally don't see the value in that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just go to a decimal right away and say the chance of getting a face card is about 2308 and like always if we are going to round we want to minimize our error by rounding to the nearest so since this 7 is followed by a 6 I'm going to round up okay and then let's look at one last question with this what's the probability that the card we select will not be C so the probability of not C there's a couple ways we could approach that. We know that we're randomly selecting a card, so our denominator is 52. We could say, all right, what is C? C is that it's a spade. So if it's not a spade, what is it? Could be a heart, could be a diamond, could be a club. How many of these are there? 13. How many of these are there? 13. How many clubs are there? 13. So it'd be 13 plus 13 plus 13. It should be 39 out of 52. It's a perfectly valid approach. But another way that we could do it that I think is actually a little more clever and a little faster is to say, look, I know there's 52 cards in the deck and I know that 13 of them are spades and I don't want those 13. So I could just subtract those 13 away from the total of 52 and I'll get 39 out of 52.
which is the same as if I add up the 13 diamonds, the 13 clubs, and the 13 hearts, but it's a little bit of a more clever approach and one that if you are able to digest will pay off later on, making some problems easier when you have this subtraction tool in your arsenal. And if I reduce that, which again is not totally necessary, but if I do that, I get three-fourths, which makes sense because spades make up one-fourth of the deck. That means the other three-fourths must be things that are not spades. And as a decimal, that would be 0 0.75. All right, so again, just a reminder, don't stress over memorizing things about a deck of cards, but they might bring it up in homework. I might bring it up in practice, maybe even in a collaborative where you have a chance to ask other people. I would not put it on a test, so don't feel like you have to memorize that information about a deck of cards. All right, so they're asking us some things about probability there, so let's go ahead and summarize a few facts. So if you're using the theoretical method, that applies for equally likely outcomes. So that applies well to rolling a die, where you have six sides and it's equally likely to be any one of those. It also applies well to a deck of cards where you randomly pick one. There's lots of different places it applies. So this idea applies with equally likely outcomes. And if you want to do probability, you want to count what is the total possible number of outcomes. If you're rolling a die, six sides, so your denominator is going to be six. If you're doing cards, there's 52 of them, so your denominator would be 52. It's important to know how many things are possible. And then think about among all those things that are possible, how many of them are ways that your event can occur, and then make a fraction out of that. Notice that they told you to count the number of possible outcomes first. So they're actually saying the denominator should happen first and then the numerator, and I definitely agree with that advice. When you're doing probability, a bottom-up approach usually makes it a little easier to understand. So think, how many things can happen in this experiment? How many meet what I've been asked for? So an example of that, if I look up at um, the probability of C that we just did, they're saying we're randomly selecting a card, so I start off saying there's 52 cards possible, and then out of those 52, how many of them were spades, which is what event C was, and then I fill that in. That is an approach I definitely recommend on probability. If the questions are easy, you might find that you could work top down, but as questions get harder to get them right, you usually have to work from the bottom up, and so I would just try and make a habit out of that for all the questions so that when the tough ones come along, you're ready and your normal strategy is the right strategy. All right, moving on to page seven, I'd like to go ahead and show you another example of probability. This one's a little bit more complicated, and it also helps to illustrate the fundamental rule of counting. So consider rolling two fair dice, and to say that the dice are fair just means that each of the six sides on them are equally likely to be the one that lands face up. Find the probability that the sum will be seven when you roll those two dice. This is an important number in um, the game of craps, which is a popular casino game. And uh, it also turns out to be the most likely sum when you roll two dice. And so I think it's just a, a good opportunity to look at a little bit of a more complicated probability question and see if we can figure it out. I'd recommend you go ahead and pause the video here for a moment and then try and see if you can come up with an answer and then hit play again and see what I have to say about that. All right, so looking at the probability that the sum will be seven, a lot of people, when they go to figure this out, one of the things that you want to think about in probability, as I mentioned before, is if it is a difficult question, it would be good to go from the bottom up. And in the bottom, you should think how many things are possible. So we bring in the two dice, and people think about those, and they say, okay, there's six possibilities here, and there's six possibilities over here, and then they put a 12 on the bottom because 6 plus 6 is 12. But remember the fundamental rule of counting says that there should actually be 36 possibilities. And it turns out that is the case. And to illustrate that for you, let me find the one here. If you had a one on this die, then that can create uh, six different outcomes. It could be the one in the six, which is a seven, the one in the three, the one in the two, the one in the one, the one in the four, and the one in the five. Those are six different outcomes, and that's all just with the one. So now if I find the two on this one, I could leave this as a 2, do the six different sides here, I'd be up to 12 combos, and then I go to the 3, get six more combos. So I'm going to have six things here to go with the six I can get each way there. That should be 36 possibilities. One way to illustrate that is to make a table. So I'm going to come over here off to the side, and I'm going to say, alright, what can I get when I roll two dice? And let's say that one of them is a red die. One, two, three, four, 
5 and 6 are the possibilities on that. And let's say that the other die is a blue. Even though both the ones I showed you with are red, sometimes it's nice to um, visualize these as being different colors. It helps us to sort out some things that trick people at times. And then say, all right, so what are all the different sums I can get? So if I have the one on the first die, let's pretend that's blue. Use your imagination. And then the red one can be all these different numbers, one through six. If I leave that one stable, the smallest total I could get would be the two ones, which would create a sum of two. And the biggest possibility would be if I got the one and the six, which would be a sum of seven, and we get all the different possibilities in between. So there's six of my possible outcomes. And then if this one's a two, and we find the one on this one, we could roll a three would be the smallest that we could get all the way up to rolling an eight if that two is paired with the six. So the eight would be here on this end. And we have all the possibilities in between. And you might start to notice a pattern developing in that table, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we followed that pattern, this should go on to be four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, representing the different things that we can get if we roll a three on that first die. If this die is a four, the smallest possibility we could get would be a five, and then six, seven, eight, nine, all the way up to ten, which we can see there, the four and the six. And then if it's a five on this one, a five with a one would be a six, and we can get seven, eight, nine, ten, and as you see here, we could get an eleven would be the max. And then what if we rolled a 6 on this one? Then if it was paired with a 1 over here, that would be a 7. And then going up, we could get 8, 9, 10, 11, and as we see here, a total of 12. But one of the things I want you to see in this chart is there's not 12 different possibilities. There's 36. 6 times 6. You can count them up if you want, but if it's 6 by 6, that should be 36 different ways that can turn out. So of those 36, how many produced a sum of seven, and we can just go hunting for those, and I find one, two, three, four, five, six different ways that came up with a seven. So I would say that probability is six out of 36, which you could reduce if you'd like. I'm just gonna go on the calculator and divide that out. Six out of 36 is 0.16 repeating, or rounded to four decimals, 0.1667. So about a little more than a 16% chance that you'd roll a sum of seven when you roll two dice. Let me give it a shot. Ha, huh. that was pretty lucky. I was just trying to do an example, but there it is. Turns out if you look at the chart, there's nothing more likely to come up than a seven, but it's still only a 16% chance. So that's some pretty lucky video there that it happened that way for me. Uh, when we look at this chart and I count the six ways, there are times where people object because they're saying, wait a minute, you counted a five and a two twice because you counted it here and then you counted it again there. But this is where I like to bring in the colors. A five on the blue die and a two on the red is different from a five, a two on the blue die and a five on the red. If I have a five and a two and I just switch them, that's not a new roll. But if I take this and turn it so it's the 2 and turn this one so it's a 5, those are different sides showing on the dice. That's a different outcome, and they, they both need to be counted. So it is correct to count both of those options, and you see them showing up in the table. Once you've got the table made, it's pretty easy to go on and answer other probability questions, like what's the probability that the sum is greater than 8? We can look at the chart, and all these numbers in this triangle pen I just made are bigger than eight and then we just need to say how many are there one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and remember it's not just ten it's a fraction ten out of how many ten out of thirty six and then what is ten out of thirty six as a decimal point two seven seven eight so the probability that the sum would be greater than 8 is 10 out of 36 which you could reduce if you want which my math lab might insist you do or going to a decimal 0.2778 or going to a percentage 27.78 percent alright so far we've been talking about theoretical probability where everything is equally likely but there's actually some other types as well including empirical probability and subjective probability and even a fourth one, even though they don't list it, which I would say is the Monte Carlo method, which is related to empirical, and maybe that's why they don't um, list it as a different option. But uh, I think it's worth kind of throwing out there as its own name as well. So a theoretical probability is based on a model 
where all the outcomes are equally likely. And we mentioned that when we first started doing the counting. If you're going to do counting, you need all 36 of these things to be equally likely. And it's determined by making a fraction where you divide the number of ways the event can occur by the total number of possible outcomes. But there's other ways of getting probabilities well. One example is empirical probability, and that's based on observations or experiments, and it's the relative frequency of the event of interest. When you do empirical probability, what you're doing is still making a fraction, but it's by repeating the observation several times. So instead of making a chart, maybe we take the two dice and we roll them like 800 times and we see how often a 7 came up, and then we just make a fraction out of that. One of the things that we want to know here is that when you use this method, you're getting an approximation. So empirical probability doesn't tell you what the real probability is, but it gives you an estimate. And the more times the experiment was conducted, the better the approximation tends to be. So I'll get a better estimate of the probability of the sum being 7 if I roll the dice 600,000 times instead of just 600. A subjective probability is an estimate that's based on experience or intuition. So that's just more of a gut feeling. Somebody says hey, what's the chance do you think you'll make it to my party this Saturday night? And you say, I don't know, probably like 60% that I'll be there. You probably didn't do any math on that. You were just um, trying to come up with an intuitive estimate where you feel like this is probably right. The Monte Carlo method uses computer simulations rather than a real-life data collection to get empirical probability. So when I talk about rolling two dice 600,000 times, you'd think, who's going to have the patience to do that and not me? I don't think I could make it through 600 rolls and doing all the tallying. But I have written a computer program to do it, and then I don't mind doing it 600,000 times or even 6 million times. And what's nice about a Monte Carlo method is that means that you can use a really large number of uh, experiments or repetitions of the experiment and that means your approximation of the probabilities will be really good. That is, if all the assumptions you made when you wrote the program are right. So sometimes doing the real life experiment, even if you don't know what the proper assumptions are, you can just see how it turns out in real life. Uh, but those take time. If you can kind of model all the conditions correctly in your computer program, the Monte Carlo method giving you uh, millions or billions of tries has that advantage of a uh, really large sample size. All right, so let's go ahead and look at that idea. For each of the following, let's find the indicated probability, but let's also state which of the three uh, methods were used. So what's the probability of randomly meeting someone born on a Sunday? Now, I actually took this wording straight from the book. To be honest with you, I don't love the wording, so I'm going to reword it for you as well. Uh, what is the probability that the next person you meet will end up being born on a Sunday? Uh, so... If you think about that, what's the chance of somebody being born on a Sunday? Is it more likely than a Saturday or a Tuesday? Most people would say, look, when the baby's ready to come, the baby will come. And so a Sunday should just be as likely as a Tuesday or a Thursday or anything else. So one answer we could give to that would be, look, there's seven days possible when the baby can be born. One of those is a Sunday. So we could say it's one-seventh. And one out of seven is 0.1429. So there's about a 14.29% chance that that um, person will have been born on a Sunday. And I'm using theoretical probability there. And I think that this is what they intended us to say, and I think it's a pretty common answer that people would give. I don't know that it's really right, because not all babies are born through a natural childbirth process. Some of them are cesarean sections. Some of those C-sections are scheduled, and the doctor is probably unlikely to schedule that for a Sunday. It's more likely to be a weekday when he would normally work rather than on the weekend when he was planning to be at a barbecue or watching the big game. So when it's a natural childbirth, it may be the baby comes when it comes, but there's other ways that birth happens, and sometimes it's scheduled, and a Sunday might not be as likely of a day to have it scheduled. So this is the only one I can do the math for you on, but I would argue if you really wanted to know what's the probability that somebody would be born on a Sunday, 
that a better method would probably be to use empirical probability, look at birth records, maybe look at thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of births, and just see how often a Sunday is there. If you have a really large amount of data, then you're going to you're going to have an approximation, but it'll be a good one, and I wouldn't be surprised if the probability of it being a Sunday ends up being less than 0 0.1429 due to the fact that when people have a choice, they would probably avoid the Sunday, or at least their doctor might avoid that Sunday. So it's kind of an interesting thing. This is what I think they want us to say, seven days a week, Sunday's one of them, but are they all really equally likely? Maybe not, and if they're not equally likely, theoretical doesn't work, but empirical still would. All right, let's look at another one. What's the probability of randomly meeting someone born in April or October? And again, I would say it's the same sort of uh, rewording that they mean, what's the probability that the next person you meet would have been born in April or October? And we'll do this from the same approach, theoretical probability, and say, well, how many months are there? How many possibilities are there for what month a person would be born? And we'd say there's 12. And then we could say, and out of those months, how many are we listing? Two. And so we could say it's a 2 out of 12, which is 1 6, or approximately 0 0.1667. And if I do it that way, that would be using theoretical. I don't even know if that's the best theoretical approach. Another option that we might have done on that, which probably gives a little bit of a different answer, let me go ahead and show that in color, would be to say there's, there's 365 days in a year, I believe that April is one of our months that only has 30 days and October has 31 and if we do that, do it that way, I think we'll get an answer that's a little bit different. 30 plus 31 divided by 365 is pretty close but 0 0.1671. So if I'm counting days I get this answer. If I'm counting months I get this one. Those are both using a theoretical approach and I don't know if that's the right approach. Is, is a baby just as likely to be born in April as October? I don't know. I know that for some animals, they are born. They tend to be born in the spring and less likely to be born in the winter and different things for people. I don't think that's necessarily the case, but I bet there are some times a year where there's more babies born than others. So I think instead of theoretical, which is the only one I can do with the information given in the problem, empirical might be a better thing. Let's look at the birth records and just see out of the next hundred thousand babies that are born, how many of them turned out to be born in April and October, and that might give us a sense of is it higher or lower, because maybe there is something to that where those months are more or less common than some of the others. Let's take a look at one more. What's the probability of a baseball player with a 300 batting average getting a hit in his next at bat? So when it says that they're a 300 batting average player, that actually comes from say, taking the number of times they've been up and counting how many times did they get a hit and dividing that by the number of at-bats they have and so that's just empirical evidence right so this number right here is the relative frequency from what we've seen from this player how often do they get a hit and it's about thirty percent of the time or they're saying it is exactly thirty percent of the time and that empirical calculation that we have from our real life data is our best estimate of the probability. So what's the probability of them getting a hit? I would say that I would expect that to be 300. If saying there are 300 hitters says everything we've seen from them so far says that 3 out of 10 times they get a hit. So we would use that as our best estimate for the probability. And when we do it that way we are using the empirical method. So empirical probability is our option there. And I guess I would just add to that, um, I would trust a batting average like that more towards the end of the season than at the beginning because at the end of the season there's more at bats, there's more data. If we're just a few um, games into the season, this estimate, this approximation isn't going to be as good if there's not as much data involved. So that's something to keep in mind when you're dealing with empirical probability. More data should be a more accurate probability. Less data, it's more of a rough approximation. All right, moving on to the next page. We're just looking at a few more examples where we're trying to calculate probability and classify which method that we used. So you count 42 heads when you toss a coin 100 times. If you don't know whether the coin is fair, then what's the probability that the next toss will be a head? 
Now, if we knew the net, that the coin was fair, then I would use theoretical probability and say there's two sides. One of them is a head, so the chance of heads on the next toss is one half or 0.5 or 50 percent. But if I don't know whether or not it's fair, then my best estimate of the probability is the data I've collected. So I would say that my best guess of the probability of heads on that next toss would be based out of the 100 tosses that I've done. And in those tosses, 42 of them turned out to be heads. And if we do that as a decimal, that's 0.42 or 42%. And because I'm basing that not on a theoretical method of there being two sides, one of which is a head, but just being based on the data that I've collected from experiments, that would be an example of an empirical probability.